Welcome to episode 233. Today I'm interviewing audiobook narrator Mark Bramhall. Find out about his experience while narrating the book The Hero's Brother by M. Scott Anderson. Stay tuned. Today's episode is brought to you by the Shelf Addiction Merch Store. Check out all the bookish t-shirts, notebooks, mugs, and more. Don't miss out on these original designs, perfect for any book nerd. Support the podcast and visit shelfaddiction.com forward slash merch and pick up your next favorite bookish item. Hey everyone, I am your host, Tamara Ford, and welcome to Book Chat here on the Shelf Addiction Podcast. Here on Book Chat, we get bookish with roundtable book discussions, book recommendation lists, interviews, and more. Be sure to check out shelfaddiction.com for even more content. Before we get started, let me tell you a bit about today's interview guest. Mark Bramhall has appeared in leading roles off-Broadway, regionally, and at most Southern California venues. He is a prolific, multi-award winning audiobook narrator, recipient of the American Library Association's 2016 Odyssey Award, a two-time Audi Award winner, and he's been cited annually by Publishers Weekly and Audiophile Magazine among their best voices and best audiobooks of the year. If you'd like to comment on something you've heard during today's episode, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Shelf Addiction. The links for everything related to today's episode are below in the show notes. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me today. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. So I'm super excited to talk about your newest title. But before we get into that, let's learn a little bit about you and your career in narrating. So tell me, let's start with audiobooks. Since you narrate them, do you listen for fun? I actually, I have to confess, don't listen to audiobooks much. I do listen to um, clips now because I want to see what um, the leading readers are sounding like. Um, I need to sort of get bounced that way. Um, I, before I began doing audiobooks, which was uh, now about 10 years ago, um, I hardly knew they existed. Um, I have since become, of course, fascinated with the medium. Um, but I'm fascinated from the standpoint of an actor and um, also a writer. Um, I've sort of tried to define what this particular art form is because it's one that's born of technology. Um, Yes, we had audio books, books for the blind several decades ago, but with um, desktop technology now, the digitization of the universe, um, it's a whole new ball game. And so I've been uh, looking to sort of define what it means to me. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going too far into the weeds here in terms of what you asked me. Um, oh, no, you're good. So since you don't really listen to audiobooks for fun, how did you get into audiobooks? Like what made you say, hey, let me try this on for size and see if I like it? Uh, let me amend that. I do listen to audiobooks, especially if I'm on a long drive. I do love to listen to audiobooks. Um, and I, I did do some of that um, when I was on several cross-country drives or, you know, um, from California to Washington or Oregon. Um, so, yes, uh, I, I do appreciate <laughs> our medium, um, but uh, it's not a habit of mine. And um, that's mainly been because I'm an actor as much as, uh, as much a full-time actor as I can possibly manage to be. And that actually doesn't allow a lot of time for audiobook listening. So mm -hmm. that's partly my excuse. Um, okay. Now, to go back to your question, how did I get into it? Um, some of my actor friends were doing it and said, you should be doing this. And um, I met the marvelous, dearly departed Yuri Razovsky, um, who was making uh, full cast recordings quite often as well as recording individual books and had been doing it forever and was a wonderful mentor slash taskmaster. And he started me off and um, I, I just sort of was going by the seat of my pants, but he seemed to like what I was doing and um, took an interest in me 
and told me that um, I could have a future in this particular niche, which as it turned out, I have had. So um, I began there doing um, mainly, I think I was working for Blackstone at the beginning. Um, I, uh, I sent a audition as the audition MP3 to uh, some other of the big publishers and uh, didn't hear back for long periods of time. And then when I finally did, went in for auditions, which seemed to go well, and then waited another long stretch of time, finally got a book with Random House and they, Dan Musselman said, oh, yeah, you can do this <laughs> in, <laughs> nice. in his inimitable way. Um, and so I, after the first year or so, uh, things began to pick up and, uh, I've been working very steadily ever since. What do you like best about performing audiobooks? I, I have, um, again, I approach it as an actor. Um, it's when I, when I spoke earlier about trying to define the medium for myself, I remember those speed reading courses they used to have um, where they'd promise you, they'd get you through your homework lightning fast and you could pass your tests with complete comprehension and be reading at 1,600 or 2,000 words a minute. And the way yeah. they did it, the way they did it was to um, identify, first of all, that when you read, you have your own inner voice that sounds the words that you're seeing with your eye. And so you're hearing the book in your head with your own inner voice, which these speed reading mavens tell you is a bad, bad thing because it slows you down because you have to say all those words in your own little head. Um, mm -hmm. And if you can just shut that voice up, you can then skim at lightning speed with huge comprehension. Well, yeah, it kind of works, but that is not what... <laughs> good writing is all about. Um, I do use that technique sometimes if I'm reading an instruction manual or something yeah. like that. But it's great what, for textbooks, I, I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah. what this job is, is substituting your own voice for um, the audiobook listener's own inner voice, and you're, you're bridging between the author and the listener. And um, so it's all about voice acting. And that's what I love about it, because whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you're storytelling. And, um, you know, that's what I love about acting, too, that it appeals to something that's primal in human beings, um, our need to sort of identify who we are from the fact that we have this elaborate thing called our human brain, which is always asking that question. So when you're telling a story, whether it's on stage or um, narrating a book, you're appealing to something that's really basic, that has to do with really being connected one to another. And I guess mm -hmm. if I had to put it in a nutshell, that's, I'd say, it's why I love it. That's awesome, because I totally agree with you. From a listener standpoint, hearing someone that is kind of acting a story or sharing a story in that way versus reading a book, you can definitely tell the difference. And that make or that makes or breaks an audiobook for the listener. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um and I mean I I was doing mainly fiction for that reason because people spotted me as a, a good actor of words. Um and um I hit nonfiction a little further on. And um, that made me think, uh, okay, do I now go into something that's a little bit robotic or, or what? And then I realized, no, nonfiction writers, uh, this, and there's many, many stripes, um, are telling a story too. And, mm -hmm. and if it's worth its salt, it's a story that has the same kind of primal appeal that, that you know, addressing that question of who are we? Um, either by telling the story of an unusual person or of parts of life that we don't normally get to have a peek at or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So what has been one of your biggest challenges 
as an audiobook narrator? <laughs> um, I would say that the one of the most difficult books I've read, if not the most, was uh, William S. Burroughs' Naked Lunch. Um, it's an incredible um, stream of consciousness piece. Um, I don't know if you've read it, but it was scandalous in its time because it's hugely scatological, among other things, but brilliantly so. Um, it's a kind of tour through the hell of a drug addict's brain. Um, mm. And um, he was he was um, addicted to heroin. And um, so it's his attempt to sort of live out on the page the nightmare of that of that existence and um in anybody else's hands i suspect it would have been just an insufferable trash in mm. his <laughs> it's a kind of um it's a kind of uh miltonic epic of of human degradation but it's propelled by his desire to rid himself of it, to step away from it. That's why he did it. And anyway, uh, I'm going far afield. I'm sounding like <laughs> the English major that I am. Uh, but, it's okay. Don't worry about it. It's good to hear. Uh, you know, you're passionate about it. And that is definitely something that I applaud. Absolutely. Well, the reason it was so difficult is because in this epic piece he has level upon level upon level upon level so you'll have a character who tells a story which includes another character who also tells a story which includes another character who also tells a story on and on and on down level after level um, each story incredibly detailed and in populated with all sorts of um, bizarre people places and things and you can't lose sight of level one when you're on level 12. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably... That sounds hard. complicated. Very. <laughs> yeah. Very. Absolutely. So on the flip side, you have like you have a pretty good catalog of audiobooks. How many have you done? Um, I'm somewhere between three and 400 now. Whoa. Oh my gosh. So I know this next question is probably going to be impossible for you to answer, but do you have like a favorite performance that you've done on an audiobook? Um I have some favorites plural. Um Okay. Some of them are personal favorites which um may or may not have wide appeal. Um and others uh, just are beautiful, beautiful pieces that fell into my lap and I got to be the reader. Um, let's see, what are some of my favorites? Um, I did, I did um, a wonderful book by a new author named Laura Pritchett called The Blue Hour, in which I was a, a member of a, a, a full cast uh, because it's a collection of short stories. But I read a chapter of that, which was stunningly beautiful. And um, uh, I uh, developed a friendship with Laura on the basis of it because she was pleased with it. And I just had to compliment her on her, her work. Um, I've done uh, Everybody's Fool by Richard Russo. That was, a, that was a joy. That was an incredible joy to do. The man is so... He's like an American Chekhov, the way he writes. Um, and um, so he finds the absurdity in everything, but he delivers it with deadly seriousness. And um, <laughs> it's wonderful. I mean, people are hit by lightning and <laughs> um, snakes get lost in a hotel. And um, it sounds like slapstick, but it's not. It's the human comedy at a deep level. Um, what else? I did a nonfiction book called American Desperado, um, which is, uh, he had a, a help from a ghostwriter, John, I believe John Richards is his name. I'm not sure I have his last name correct, J-O-N, John, but it's called American Desperado, and he 
was born into the Gambino crime family in New York, and he sort of grew up as a mafia person. That's, wow. That was his childhood, and it's where he went. And uh, he learned all the most horrible practices, dirty tricks, and violent behaviors of a, of a mafia soldier, and um, was um, in danger of being uh, busted for life um, at some point, and got out of the country, came back, and established himself as the cocaine king of the country when the the cocaine uh, trade began to skyrocket. And he based himself mm. in Florida. And he tells his whole story, which includes some incredibly awful incidents. Um, at the end of his life, he, he uh, flipped and became a state's witness, um, jeopardizing his own life, obviously. But it's all told in his own voice and with his own um, casual uh, attitude about the most horrific stuff. Um, that was kind of an amazing journey. But you know what? I'm like an actor. If you ask me what my favorite role is, I'll tell you that it's the one I'm working on, whatever it happens to be. Um, yeah. I have very very few books that I can say, no, I never want to come near that again. <laughs> oh, well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> that means you must have a really great method of choosing what audio books you want to go in for. How do you go about selecting what you think would be a good pairing for you? Um. Actually, um, I'm lucky enough that other people are doing that for me. Um, the editors at Blackstone, Brilliance, uh, Dion, Random House. Um, I, I'm old enough so that uh, I don't keep a home booth uh, percolating all the time, um, as my younger friends do, because I have uh, the good luck to have my social security and several pensions working for me. So if I'm not doing a book for a few weeks, I'm not sweating getting food on the table. So I get to wait for assignments. And nine times out of 10, the assignments are right up my alley. And I love it. Um, people know me well enough now to sort of um, hand me stuff that um, is I turns out to be very tasty. And it's in all kinds of genres, uh, fiction, nonfiction, young adult, um, sci-fi, uh, horror, mysteries. Um, one of my favorite books, one of my favorite books came from Macmillan. Uh, it's a part of a Swedish detective series um, by a husband-wife team that identifies themselves. They, their nom de plume is Lars Kepler, and they're very, very popular in uh, Europe um, as writers of these uh, detective stories. <clears throat> and uh, mm -hmm. I've done a few of those. Um, you got me going now. Make me shut up. <laughs> Well, since you've read so many different genres, obviously you have an appreciation for pretty much almost anything you read. I would love to know, do you have a dream author that you would just really want to read a book for them? Even if it's like a new edition or something, is there one that you just really want to do? Um, I, I have some favorites that, I mean, I, I read a book of E.L. Doctorow's. Um, who is, you know, one of the preeminent novelists of the 20th century, now gone, now deceased, as of, I think, about five years ago. But uh, in the course of things, um, I got to know him a little bit, and I would have done anything. If he had written the phone book on toilet paper, I would have recorded it for him. <laughs> um, and uh, there are a few others. I, I did a couple of books by Wallace Stegner, another giant. Um, who just happens, um, happenstance, my, my um, aunt, my mother's sister, now deceased, um, became a writer of note at age 76. Um, her name is Harriet Dorr, and she wrote a book called Stones for Ibarra, uh, which got the National Book Award, her first book, which she published at age 76. And um, wow. it turned out that her writing mentor was Wallace Stegner. Stegner. So um, to be able to read a couple of his books was just a special thrill. 
Is there one that I'm waiting for to come off the presses? Um, I don't know. One of the things that the business has made me aware of is how illiterate I am. I mean, I have this huge fancy college education. I graduated from Harvard, et cetera. And yet I truly feel illiterate all the time. I, I just am amazed at how much brilliant stuff there is out there that I'm seeing for the first time um, as a result of narrating it. Yeah. So, so I'm just waiting. Well, you know, you read above the average amount of books than a lot of people around the world <laughs> just through narrating books. I know. You know, and as a yeah, as a blogger and, you know, podcaster about books, I I think I read higher than average as well. But a lot of people just don't read like that, like they used to. I know. I know it's it's uh terrifying to me because when you read you you think in a different way than even when you read a screen, you know. Um, I'm mm -hmm. I make it a practice to turn some actual physical pages in an actual physical book um, as much as possible. Um, I'm reading an amazing book right now by Timothy Snyder. He's a historian, um, and his book is called The Road to Unfreedom, uh, subtitled Russia, America, no Russia. Russia, Europe, America. And it's kind of uh, this brilliant uh, prize-winning historian's macro view of the world. And if anything, if we needed anything now, it's a macro view of the world. <laughs> Who are you telling? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, so today let's talk a little bit about your newer audio book, The Hero's Brother by M. Scott Anderson. I have a little quick snippet that we'll play. Everyone take a listen and then we'll come back and we'll talk about that book. The wind now blew cold from the northwest. After gathering enough wood for the night, Frith built a fire on the mudslide near enough to the injured white stag to warm him. The wood was still wet, and the smoky fire made his eyes water. Throughout the day he'd nibbled on the stale oaten cakes he had bought in Lichgate, what he'd give now for another helping of last night's leftover goose. After a few hours' vigil he began to nod off, only to be startled by Hrothvitha's worried whinnying from across the stream where she had been peacefully grazing. The white stag's nose wiggled. His eyes seemed to open wider. Wizard? Frith asked hopefully. Are you there? In answer, four mysterious little lights sprang from the wood. Okay, Mark, so we just listened to a quick snippet of that, and it sounds really great. Um, tell me a little bit about the book. It is um, a huge book. Um, he has, uh, Scott Anderson has worked on this book since he was in college. He has been literally on this, working on this book for 40 years. <laughs> um, so it's long. Um, yeah. But that's, uh, you know, if you left it at that, it would turn everybody off. Oh, it's long. It is vast. It's a, he has a huge, amazingly detailed, widespread imagination. So he has created literally a whole world. Um, there is a map at the beginning of the book that uh, actually details geographically um, where his story is set. And it reminds me a little bit of uh, the opening credits of, uh, of um, uh, you know, the R.R. R. Martin series. Oh, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, where you come flying in over the lands. Um, he has He has a similar or an analogous set of lands and populations in them, islands, shires, different countries. And um, I will say that the book is difficult to identify by genre, but I would call it, a, for genre, a kind of mashup of um, Harry Potter and, um, um, what did I say earlier? The... Um, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings and and uh, Game of Thrones. A little soup song yeah. of Game of Thrones. It's it isn't um, so much Game of Thrones. That's a little bit more adult and a little bit more battle oriented than this is. This is mainly aimed at a young audience, but it includes, as you might guess, older readers as well. 
Yeah. You mentioned that there's a map in the front of the book. And whenever someone says there's a map, I just know we are in for some vast, Mm -hmm. wide and deep world building. Yep, that's right. And uh, he is he's had 40 years (laughs) to develop this world. Uh, So he has um, along with the hero's brother, his main character, who is the somewhat slighted and slight younger brother of the very heroic hero. Um, He has a a gang of seven other leading characters. Um, And these are just the lead characters. Then there are supporting characters. The lead characters um, have accents that um, base, base themselves. I won't say they're equivalent to the modern version but they base themselves in accents of France and Britain and Ireland and um, Persia and um, I forget. But to do a conversation, of which there were quite a few, that involves all of them, <laughs> mm-hmm. there was a challenge. Um, I do have a facility with accents, um, and this pushed me to the limit, I have to tell you. Um, and the young lead is um turns out to be heroic in heart indeed um but unprepossessing when we first meet him i gave him a slight lisp which actually i didn't give him scott gave it to him and i picked it up i i noted that in one passing mention of it so his name is frith but um we say frith um huh. But we try not to say it in such a way that it's ridiculous and allows for him to evolve into a very powerful, heroic person. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's episodic. It goes through endless episodes um, that are each incredibly detailed. um, But it has a a through line um, and takes us from his his, uh, sort of shy, retiring, um, befuddled self into his manhood. Um, and, uh, it's, it's brilliant that way. Um, if Mm, you, how long is this audio book? How long is it? The audio book running time is a little longer than 19 hours. Oh yeah. That's a big one. But, uh, not as long as the longest one I've done. Uh, the longest one was a, a nonfiction that I did last summer summer before last, the uh, Ron Chernow's biography of Ulysses Grant. Um, wonderful biography. 50 hours. Ooh, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. long. Yep. <laughs> With the hero's brother, how did you come to uh, t- perform this audiobook? Was this one that a publisher handed to you or did you get it another way? I got it another way, which was just um, dumb luck. Um, it's, it turned out... Um, His college roommate, he went to Reed College in Oregon, and his college roommate is a person who is happens to be a friend of mine. Um, who he's a theater artist, he's a writer, um, he's a director, and um, he's had a long career. And uh, he and I have worked together here in Los Angeles. So when Scott was uh, casting about to make an audio book of the uh, finished piece, he asked his friend if he knew anybody. And of course, he wound up being referred to me by our mutual friend. Um, We talked, he looked at my creds. Um, I don't know if I, I'm not sure if I made a sample for him. I don't think I did, but I may have. Um, Anyway, he was very enthusiastic and, um, was happy to bring me in and um, pay me handsomely. And uh, for me, it was a first as well, because I I uh, had never done one that sort of was an author coming in for the first time. Oh, did you spend a lot of time like working with him on the characters or did he kind of hand it off to you and say, you know, you're the expert here, do what you will? Pretty much. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I didn't uh, ask him a lot of questions. I asked him for a pronunciation guide because he has invented all sorts of words. Um, so I wanted to have those right. Um, but other than that, I, I, I certainly felt free to ask questions if I needed to, but the book kind of explains itself quite well. So I, mm -hmm. I decided, uh, he's going to trust me. And so, um, you know, I, th I think he tuned into what we were doing as we recorded it so that I, if we went wildly astray, he would have stopped us. Um, but no, we didn't have a lot of, um, intense prep speaking to one another. What about the characters with, you know, you said there were seven main characters along with <laughs> other sub characters. Did you have a favorite that you liked narrating for the best? Uh, well, there were, um, there is a Frenchman who is very, very full of himself and he's always trying to take credit for every battle that has been won. And, um, <laughs> there's, um, there's, a. Uh, a permanently horny Irish lady who is always, she sleeps with everybody just as a matter of course. And so um, whether or not she sleeps with our hero uh, becomes uh, questionable as the book goes on. <laughs> um, and she, uh -huh. has, she has a sister who's a ferocious virago of a woman who um, is very good at killing anybody who bothers her. Yes, yeah, so my kind of lady. <laughs> <laughs> um and uh, uh who else oh my gosh um i i can't remember all the details now that's one of the um one of the failings of of my own head i it's like again the acting mentality when i go from one play to the next you kind of put the the first one on a shelf and uh you yeah. become so busy focusing on the next one that it fades it wakes up again if you revisit it, but um, I don't have it in front of me. I haven't heard the whole version. Um, I thought of sort of delving into it in preparation for this, but I didn't. <laughs> well, hey, you know, I understand. I kind of can relate to that with um, doing a lot of podcast interviews, mm -hmm. you know. I try to remember, I mean, I've interviewed over a hundred people now and it's mm -hmm. like, oh, some of them, you just don't remember everything. Yeah, until... <laughs> right. It's like your Facebook friends, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I went to the theater the other night and somebody came up to me and said, hi, Mark. And I did the thing that I hate doing of going, hi, not knowing who <laughs> I was talking to, um, but sort of vaguely recognizing the face and then doing what I the only reason I, I still am in Facebook is so that I can go and find out who that was. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Did you find that person on your Facebook friends list? I did. I did. I the reason Okay, good. <laughs> the reason I joined Facebook was because I did that no. I it was after a show and a friend came be came backstage and there were some there was several people waiting in the lobby. And uh, I came out and my friend congratulated me and I did not remember his name. And I decided I would be frank and say, uh, just speak my mind and say, I'm very, very sorry, but I just can't remember your name. And he looked at me and he said, Mark, you and I have worked together on stage. <laughs> <laughs> not only not only that like how dare you <laughs> oh really and really he had every uh, he had every right to say this and he said not yeah. only that but this is the third time you have done this <laughs> oh no so um a i have never forgotten his name since and b i joined facebook so that i could perhaps curtail that happening uh somewhat <laughs> Oh, that's dreadful. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> sometimes it happens to the best of us. I don't know. <laughs> it's, an L it's an L.A. thing. We don't see each other uh, in the flesh often enough because, you know, it takes an hour to go anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, awesome. So before we wrap up this conversation, is there anything else you want to share with us about The Hero's Brother? Check it out. Um, you know, it's... Um, we're we're basically launching it the three of us uh that is to say you me and the author um we're just sort of sailing it like a paper airplane out there into the universe that's crowded with millions of audiobooks um 
And so I, I, I say, have a listen. Um, I think you yeah. might like it a lot. Um, even though, uh, you know, I've compared it with um, some books that are that are um, already top sellers in their in their categories. This is nothing to be sneezed at. This is an amazing piece of work. And as I said, incredibly detailed. And uh, it's a beautiful read, especially for for young readers. Um, I remember I I was read to by my mother books that were far over my head at the time she read them. She read me Moby Dick when I was probably seven. Um, but I learned something. I, and I, I learned something about language. I learned something about storytelling. And um, this book is not as far ahead of young readers as that was for me. Um, mm -hmm. It's Somebody should read it to their kids at bedtime. Yeah, it's one of those kind of books. I'll remember when my parent read me this book. It yeah. was amazing kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Wonderful. Okay, so I guess we're going to end things there. Thank you, Mark, for introducing us Thank to you. you and the Hero's Brother. It's been a blast. Um, yes, well, I'm, I talked your ear off and, as usual, got into the weeds several times, but there you go. <laughs> Yeah, everyone loves that. No worries. Everybody loves when, when when people guests do that. They love it. So you're good. <laughs> okay. Um, for, as far as advice, you were saying, did I have any yeah. advice? I listened to your um, lovely interview with Tavia um, Gilbert. Isn't she awesome? She's she, awesome. She is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, we we had a brief conversation at the Audis this last year um, where I actually won one. And... Um, but not the kind that that she did. That's my, I'd love to get one for reader of the year. That would be a goal. Anyway, mm -hmm. she gave great advice at the end of your interview with her, which was to go to the um, audio publishers um, association and look at their getting started. I forget what it's called, but they have a, they have some good advice there for people starting out as narrators. Yeah, so that's co-signed then. It's co-signed by Mark. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so definitely check that out. Okay, everyone, if you would like to know more about Mark, be sure to visit the coordinating blog post. You can also find him on social media. The links are in the show notes. You can also pick up a copy of The Hero's Brother also in the show notes. Thanks again, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, that's it for today. All right, guys, until next time. Happy reading. Take care, everyone. If you enjoyed today's book chat episode and would like to show your support, there are a few things you can do. Head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a positive five-star review. You can follow me on Twitter at Shelf Addiction. Most importantly, you can share this podcast with friends and family that enjoy all things bookish, including author interviews. Thank you for listening, and until next time, happy reading. Happy reading.